Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today is a coaching episode with Shaylin, who is the mom of two little boys who are seven and five. We talked, as is usually the case, mostly about one of her children, her more intense child, her seven-year-old, and about troubles that he has falling asleep, also some perceived social troubles that his mom was thinking that he had and sort of her aha around that, as well as some challenges that he was he has been experiencing that could be possibly related to possible ADHD. So we covered a lot. It was, I think, a lot of things that probably you you also struggle with as a parent. If you're like a lot of the parents in my community, these are some really common issues that come up. And be sure to stick around to hear what happened after Shaylin tried some of the suggestions that we talked about and how it went for her. So let's dive in and meet Shaylin and also... If you are interested in being on the podcast, getting coached by me, please reach out. You can either message me on Facebook or Instagram, or you can shoot an email off to sarah at sarahrosensweet.com, and we can talk about you coming on the podcast and getting coached. Okay, let's meet Shaylin. Hi, Shaylin. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. So tell us a little bit about you and your family. Okay. So I'm Shaylin, and I'm the mom of two little boys. They are seven. Beckett is seven, and Theo is five. They could not be more different. They are um, basically they don't look alike. They don't act alike. There's nothing about them that is similar from day one. Um, so that's been uh, fun and interesting. Uh, but it's uh, me, my husband, the two boys, and our dog living um living all together okay so how can i support you today well so both of the kids like i said they're so different so there's different challenges going on but right now i find myself really struggling to figure out how to support my oldest especially when it comes to there's two issues really that he's struggling with right now it's really cool so he's in first grade and just wrapping it up kind of the end of the school year and he already says that he hates school. He's bored. He like doesn't want to go. That's that's really tricky. And then our other kind of issue at the moment with him is that he has the hardest time falling asleep. Mm. Super consistent. It's an every night thing. And it, or, you know, we've tried basically everything that I can think of. So I'm trying to figure out how do I support him at school and how do we get him to go to sleep at right. a night? Right. Okay. So let's start with the sleep thing. You mentioned in the the questions I sent over to you before that you're fairly certain that he has ADHD. Yeah. Um, we're going to the pediatrician later today, actually. About- yeah. Yeah. Because of family history and just like the the similarities you see and, and how you see his brain works. So ADHD kids, I don't know if you're aware of that, but ADHD kids generally have a hard time falling asleep. Like it's a it's a feature of the of the, that diagnosis. So what have you tried so far and and how long? So when you say he has a really hard time falling asleep, how long does it take him to fall asleep? So it it's a tricky thing. So it does seem, so kind of backing up just a little bit, he was a great sleeper. Like he would sleep pretty well in the middle of the day. And he did that all the way until he started kindergarten. And then he did not part of the day anymore for him. So sometimes he'll still kind of like fall asleep in the car. So it feels like he is getting overly tired Mm -hmm. towards the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Like bedtime can be kind of rough. So when we are going through the, like, you know, when there's a bath and shower or just trying to go through the brush teeth at night, we always read a book. And so we've had a very consistent bedtime routine for his whole life. During that time, he will get so, 
big movements with his body. He'll be jumping on the bed. He'll be jumping on the chair. He'll be trying to do things to intentionally. I mean, it sounds bad, but like he he is intentionally annoying us sometimes. Because I'll be like, hey, bud, it's time to sit down. And, and he'll be like, but what about this? But what about this? But what about this? You know, and he'll just kind of be kind of bouncing around and, and all of it. So mm. tried a lot of things. So to try to get him to stay in his bed when he was, you know, really little, we established kind of path routine where if you stay in your bed, you can have a pass to come out and do one thing. It really evolved to where they both will just come out cuddle with me that's always the choice that they want to make is that they'll come out and they'll either sit on the couch with me or go on my bed with me and cuddle for a few minutes usually it's like three to five minutes and then try to get them to go back that has kind of we I don't know we're, we're probably not consistent enough with the reinforcement of it but the boys share a room so what usually is fitting it after we read and kind of have them stay in the room for the rest of the evening they will they will kind of wrestle they will you know there's all sorts of we just call it they just party in there yeah and so things that we've tried that have been mildly successful have been listening to podcasts so we will let him listen to it we started with podcasts and then i felt like there was a there's one called wow in the world that's all about science and and he's really into that um but it's been too exciting for right. him at yeah. best time and so i was like okay not that. And so we've transitioned now to audiobook. Mm -hmm. It's more of like a story and a you know, longer pace, but he will he will not fall asleep listening to that. When just one one trick with that is my daughter actually still listens to audiobooks to fall asleep, but she listens to pretty much the same series all the time. I mean she has for years. And I think part of it is that she already knows what's gonna happen. And so I always suggest like maybe if he listens to something that he's already listened to, so it's not like, oh, I've got to find out what happens next. That might be yeah, helpful. Like <laughs> yeah, and, and also music. You know, yeah. music could be something that, because I think what, I think the power of that, my, one of my other children who also has ADHD also used to listen, he used to listen to music when, to fall asleep around this age. And I think it just gives the brain something to do. I think part of the reason why it's hard to fall asleep with when you have ADHD is it's hard to turn your brain off. So I think mm -hmm. it like occupies the brain enough so that you can actually kind of shut down and go to sleep. So so maybe try books that he already knows and or music that might help. Yeah, our youngest really liked music when we we tried that for a while a long time ago. So that might be something that they can they would both enjoy. They try music. So do you, the other thing is you said you said that you think that he might be overtired, which totally makes sense cuz you know, if we stay up past when we actually want to fall asleep, our body thinks it's an emergency and that we're We've got to like mobilize for like a long trek through the woods or something like that. Like, why aren't you mm -hmm. sleeping? There must be some sort of emergency happening. So our body was make, you know, adrenaline and cortisol, which can which would explain the really hyper behavior that you're seeing. Somebody that I know calls it like that they've the kids gone over the falls. Like, yeah. like, you know, you're, exactly you're getting it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So have you tried trying to get into bed earlier? Yes. We've we've like played with the bedtime. We've even thought like, well, now that you're getting older, maybe we need a later bedtime or an earlier bedtime. It, it's just it's really hard to get him to stay in the bed. And he's got they do have a really large window in their room. And now that it's getting, you know, the sun is staying up so much later. It's really hard. He's he's aware. He's like still up. I can't right. get a bed. Bro. Like, do you have blackout blinds? We don't. We just have regular blinds on that window. I would so it, I would maybe get some blackout blinds. That might be worth trying. They've mm -hmm. they've they've broken the blinds that are on that window already. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really to yeah, so maybe get some blackout blinds that might help. I remember that feeling actually as a kid of seeing the cracks in the of sunlight yeah. around the around the shade. So in terms of getting him to bed earlier, is there is there, I mean, so you said you've experimented with it, but what's happened when you've tried to do that? Let me ask you this. How many hours of sleep is he getting? So right now he's probably consistently falling asleep between nine and 10 each night. And then we get up around 6.30, 6.40. Yeah, that doesn't sound like school. enough sleep. So no. Yeah, I think, I think at this age they're supposed to have, if I remember correctly, I think around 11 hours of sleep. Yeah, we start the bedtime routine around like 6.45, 7. Like yeah. we, we aim to be like out the door, like they're in their room by 7.30. Like so kind of like so 7.30 is like potentially when he could fall asleep. 
Yeah. Okay. If, if everything right, went right. perfectly. Because he's ready at that point and you've already read and all of that mm-hmm. stuff. Like potentially mm-hmm. he could fall asleep at 730. Another suggestion that I might wonder about is could you put one of the boys to bed in your room and then move them after they fall asleep? That is right now the only thing that is working 100% for him to go to sleep is I will let him sleep in my bed. I'll let him fall asleep in my bed. It has been getting so late that it has ended up being where I'm going to bed and mm-hmm. he's sitting in the bed with me at that time because it's like the audiobook has been turned off and he's been out you know, several times. So that does work. He does really like falling asleep in my bed, like feel comfortable for him. And why not just try that? I mean, why not just say like, this is our new thing. You're going to fall asleep. I'm going to at 730, you start out in my bed and you listen to your audio book and I'll move you when after you fall, when I'm coming to bed or whatever. Yeah, uh, we haven't tried it consistently because we I think we want him to sleep in his bed. <laughs> like that's the goal. Um, well, but- so you've got Working. Something that, yeah, exactly. It's not working. Something that you're doing right now, this minute, doesn't mean that you're going to still be doing this a year from now or two years from now. Like right now, he sounds like he's overtired and he's in a cycle of being overtired. So even like a couple of months of regular falling asleep at, you know, 730, getting up at six, you might see that he just actually can fall asleep more easily. We haven't tried it consistently. So I'd be very curious to see yeah. if, if it like, holds the magic for as long you know Mm -hmm. like if it keeps working if it is consistent but well i mean i think his brother is i think that so he doesn't a because he's just when's his birthday when did he turn seven november so he's like seven and a half he's seven and yeah yeah you know seven is still especially for a kid with adhd you want to think about them as sort of two to three years behind in terms of some brain development so he still doesn't have impulse control so having his brother Like, think about it. Sleep is a non-preferred activity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, kids would rather do almost anything except for sleep. So his brother is there in the room to play with. He knows you're out there in the living room to have a snuggle with. So there are lots of, right now, there are lots of impulses that he has that stop him from getting up or or that keep him getting up out of bed, right? Mm -hmm. To play with his brother, to come and see you. So I wonder if, if taking the brother out of the equation might help him stay in bed because re- re- really every time somebody gets up they've like you're back to square one in terms of the falling asleep process right, so really yeah. you want to keep him in in the bed the, the other mm-hmm. thing that i want to ask you about is have you tried staying in the room to you know and after the whole routine is done just staying in there and like listening to a podcast or reading something on your phone or whatever just to be that reminder of it's time to sleep no more talking, no more moving. It's time yeah, to go to sleep a, now. It's been a long time since I've done it, but I do know that it works if my mom has been here. So it, whenever she's visiting and puts the kids to bed, she does sit in there and they let her do it, but they tell me to go away. Mm-hmm. They, because they, they want to play. Well, they want to play. Like, yeah, that, that's part of it. But then also I think kind of like you were just mentioning his brother as a distraction. Me being in there can also be a distraction because then he'll start asking me questions. Or and then, yeah. And, and then really you can hard. say, you can say, oh, I know you have so many things to say. I'm going to write out. I'm going to make a note in the morning. You can tell me about this in the morning. It sounds like, it sounds like maybe. Really frustrated by that. What's that? He would get frustrated. Yeah. yeah. You can build in. This is something that a lot of my clients have done. You can build in, in your bedtime routine, like time to talk, right? Like you can tell me all the things and ask me all the questions as part of the bedtime routine. Like when you're lying with him and then say, you know, everything else is going to wait till tomorrow. Some people call it like chat time or, or, you know, talking time or whatever. Because what I'm seeing is that you're holding on very tightly to your expectation that you can yeah. tuck them in and say goodnight and they're going to go to sleep. And so that whenever there's a gap between our expectation and the reality of what's happening is that it's a couple of hours of up and down and playing and back and forth. He, th- we, so, in conventional parenting, what parents use is like yelling or threats or punishments to close that gap between expectation and reality. So if you don't if you don't stop talking and you know don't stop coming out, you're not gonna get X tomorrow or you know whatever, right? Or, or yelling at kids till they're scared and they don't want to come out of their rooms. But what we have to think about in peaceful parenting is whenever you would insert like you know what should the consequence for this behavior be? Instead, what should the support be? 
that my kid needs to meet my expectation. So that's why we're talking about the listening to music or an audiobook that he already knows. That's one level of support. Removing his brother or removing him from his brother is another level of support. And if that's still not enough support, it might be somebody in the room with him um, who's going to be still and, you know, remind him that it's time to be still and quiet and that, that he needs to go to sleep, right? And that, that you're there to help him remember not to get up out of bed and, and that it's time to sleep. And maybe that's like the last resort. Maybe you try the other two things first. I think you're exactly right. I am holding on to this expectation that I want him to be able to stay in his bed and fall asleep on his own and like do the regular bedtime thing. And he will at some point, just not right. It's not working right now. He will. But also, like, to be honest, that's just such a hard time of day for all of us. We're mm-hmm. all tired by the end of the day. And it's all like we make it through bedtime. And and then I feel like, hey, okay, now I get a break. And it's like, no, the break's not over. So, yeah. I mean, well, there's there's another piece there that's so important in peaceful parenting, which is to adjust your own expectations of like, you know, I don't know if you've heard the. We'll link to it in this in the show notes for anyone who's listening, and I'll send it to you. But Corey and I did a whole episode about bedtime, you know, bedtime challenges. And one of the things was like, you know, instead of going into it thinking, maybe tonight will be the night that I just tuck them in and say goodnight, and then I'll be able to go and watch Netflix with my partner or, or do whatever. Yeah. You're like, no, bedtime is hard. Like this is, you know, it's kind of like you're bracing yourself for for something hard. And and then I think that it's a little easier to deal with when when you are you know, you, you've you psyched yourself up for this is a challenging time in the evening and giving yourself a lot of compassion about it, too. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely need to say same with my husband because he'll he'll do the thing that you were talking about where it'll be like, guys, if you don't stay in bed, there's no TV for the rest of the week or, you know, whatever it is, like as like an empty threat. And I'm always like, hey, that's really not related. You can't really do that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, here's what we're working on. So th- he comes around to it, too. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. It just, it gets to be a frustrating time. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, this is, and this is a season, right? This is like a season that you're in of frustrating bedtimes. <laughs> and with a kid with ADHD, who's really, I want to want to go back to something that you said before too, about how it feels like he's intentionally annoying you by jumping around and doing this stuff. Kids don't generally, I mean, sometimes they do intentionally annoy because they're trying to get attention, right? It's mm-hmm. like the wrong way to get attention. And so they may be doing something in- intentionally. But to me, I wonder if this is a factor of, so So my point, my side point is that kids want to be good and that they don't want to upset their parents. That's not, that might be the surface seeming motivation, but underneath that's not, that nobody ever really wants to upset their parents. Like their deep motivation is not like, I want these people to be mad at me, Right. Like that's that's never a, a deep motivation. But what it actually sounds like to me is it could be a factor of what we were talking about of him having all this, you know, overtired chemicals in his body and or attempts to regulate his nervous system through movement, which is something that, you know, what's often why we recommend doing rough housing before bed. Yeah. We we did try that. I've been listening to the podcast and that was something I was like, okay, great. We need to do some more physical play to move these you know, feelings and things just out of his body. And holy cow, that backfired so hard for us because it was like, okay, we'll do, there's something that they call monster battle that they do with dad, or we'll do a pillow fight or we'll do whatever. I gave him kind of a menu and I let them choose. We'll do this for 10 minutes and then we'll, you know, go into the brushing of the teeth and doing all the things. Uh And it was great for my youngest, like he was awesome. But my seven-year-old, it just ramped him so much more up. Mm -hmm. And then it, it took, far longer everybody ended up in tears okay the three days that we tried it in a row and i was like we're gonna try it at least for a week and then my husband was like we cannot do this more so we tried it for three days in a row and it was like okay we had to abandon that because it was like so so what happened it was like that transition after the playtime to the you know regular boring less preferred activities Mm -hmm. of you know moving through the bedtime routine couldn't happen uh, and so my oldest just had such a hard time calming his body back down. And so he ended up doing more of those like physical behaviors where he's like jumping on the bed. He was doing this thing for a while where he would like take a blanket and spin with it around the room. 
and it knocked over a water glass and it mm-hmm. broke it and like just like it was just chaos. And so I we so probably, so he may be in the t- the ten percent. I say I always say it probably about ninety percent of kids the rough housing before bed helps them calm down, but maybe he's in the ten percent where it doesn't help. I don't know. It, I, I could see it helping for my five year old. Like fun for him, and then he was like, "Okay, that time's over." But yeah, no, it backfired. So we tried that. I would say only three days, and it was yeah, literally everybody in tears. Oh, that sounds that sounds really hard. Did he like it? Did you? I mean, maybe you tried this already, but did you say like we can only if he if he really liked it? Did you say we can only do this if you can calm down afterwards? Did you give him a a chance? He's really intelligent, so like we talk about these things, and you know the I I believe he's a good kid. I believe he's not ever trying to hurt us, but he does he does like he's able to verbalize like in other times of the day. He has he got these like you know Nerf shooters, and he will come up and kind of like blast us out of nowhere and we've asked him so many times like okay if you're not gonna you need to ask us to play with you you can't just come surprise us because mm-hmm. have a reaction and he's like or, or we're like you can shoot at a target or you can you know play with you know whatever and he's like no they don't react the same way like i'm doing this to surprise you to get a reaction mm-hmm. or he's aware that he's seeking out that kind of surprised reaction or kind of like bigger reaction from yeah on. so i think that uh, i just was reading something recently about adhd and about how parents big reactions w- can whether it's you know positive or negative can be dope can give kids a dopamine release right so it sounds like that's where he's still looking for that regulation by tied to the bedtime stuff too. like yeah he's he's probably experiencing all those like stress hormones that you talked about because i can tell i think he is overtired most days and then he's doing these kind of poking behavior. Yeah, yeah. Because it does get that, you know, even, yeah. I think even sort of a negative reaction can give a, a, it's still a reaction and can give that dopamine release. You know, I'm wondering, well, maybe this is enough for you to ch- sort of go on and try and see how it works. I And I and I do think that if you're finding that putting him in another room and the audiobook or music isn't enough, I would try sitting in there just because you want him to stay in bed, right? And so- Final thing is some intrinsic motivation for feeling good the next day. Having parents, you know, you can talk to him about this. Like, you know, we want to make sure you can look up together online, you know, how many hours of sleep is a seven-year-old supposed to get and look and talk to him about how many hours of sleep he is getting and some of the things that happen to your body and your mood when you don't get enough sleep. I mean, one thing that was really motivating for my kids was when they learned that uh, the, the growth hormone is secreted at night. And the more sleep you get, the bigger you get. So I don't know if your son cares at all about being, you know, growing big and strong, but that can be a motivator also. And also, I remember talking to my kids about, you know, if I don't get a chance to, you know, have some time to myself at night and I don't get, you know, then or or I don't get enough sleep, I'm going to be super cranky the next day. And so if you want, you know, happy mom, and I'm not saying this in like a manipulative or like threatening way. But just like what a blaming way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not like in a negative way, but just like we we've got to work together. And I want to feel good the next day too. And part of mm-hmm. that is having some time at night and being able to go to bed at a decent hour. So let's work together on this. Like I know it's really, really hard to to go to bed and it's really boring. And you need sleep for these reasons. And I need you to go to sleep for these reasons. Yeah, I, I maybe I should request Wow in the World to do an episode about how important sleep is. For yeah, survival. that's a great he, idea. He he, um, if I could find um, like an expert resource on that, that's like at a kid level, that I think would be better than me talking with him about these things. Yeah, he does tend to get kind of talked out. Maybe there's like a YouTube video or something for kids. Maybe. I think there's like a lot of animated things that talk about you know the brain and. Maybe there's one about the importance of sleep. There probably is. There's a need for it. Yeah. And and it also might be part of the reason why he doesn't like school. Like this is like a segue. If he's tired, school is not going to feel as fun and it would yeah. feel harder. And it also, you know, if is he aware of his, is he aware of, of sort of his ADHD challenges? Oh, yeah. He's very aware, actually. It's something that... From, from, I guess, the last two or three years in particular, 
I've been much more confident that like, ah, yes, I'm seeing all these patterns in his brain development and he's definitely not able to do, you know, follow three-step instruction and like other things that he should have been able to do at different ages, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he does so many things that are so similar to the way that my husband's brain works. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. that, I a lot of this stuff. So we've talked a lot about how brains work. I think I, I mentioned in the questions how my five-year-old has a lot of kind of challenges with eating a variety of foods. And so in that kind of same vein, we've talked about how everybody has different taste buds and everybody's brain processes things in a different way. And so he even... Yeah, like two nights ago was telling me about math at school. And he was like, I only listen to the instructions when they're interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I don't listen anymore when it's boring to me. And I was like, okay. So that's like yeah. his way of saying that like, he literally can't pay attention. Yeah. If something's not interesting to him. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but you really like, you know, things that you really like. And then there's a lot of stuff that we have to do to get through the day or that we, you know, might find boring. So yes, he's he's aware of his brain working differently. <laughs> but when it comes to school, he is bored, but didn't. But he's like a specializer. He's not like a generalizer. Mm-hmm. So well, that's like, very, really, very ADHD. <laughs> I don't know. Basically, I'm just describing what ADHD is. He like, you know, is really into the science, kind of like the podcast stuff. He likes writing. He does not. He really resists reading. So it's challenging to get him to practice reading at home. I'm sure that that's cool, too. I'm not sure. But reading is hard for kids with ADHD because it's hard to sit still. Or at least for kids who have the impulsive hyperactive ADHD, it's hard to sit still. You could try giving him like something like a fidgeter or something like that while he's reading or sitting on a yoga ball or something like that. You know, that's so funny. This morning he built what he called a fidget toy out of Lego and he was like spinning it in his hand this morning. And I just asked, like, hey, would you want to maybe hold that at school? Like, do you think that that would help you sit still? And he just goes, oh, no, that would distract all the other kids so badly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, maybe just at home when you're reading together or something. Yeah. Oh, Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does he get any? You know what? We tried even at bedtime. My husband's idea. He tried to give him like a handful of Play-Doh so that he could stay in bed but have something to kind of, you know, play with in his hand. And that worked for like two nights. Mm Mm-hmm. That was helpful. So like, yeah, that kind of like fidgety energy, he does have that. But school, it's like academically, I'm not concerned yet. I think he will have a hard time when it's like changing classes or when the instruction for the lessons get more complicated and he doesn't pay attention to them and that sort of stuff. But what's tricky for me right now is also his like social interaction has asked for a lot of like alone time. And I think he is an introvert. He doesn't seem to seek out a lot of like he he'll he'd rather go, you know, build Legos with one friend that's our neighbor than interact with a whole group. He has a really hard time if the group wants to play a game that's different than the game he wants to play. Mm -hmm. He'll get really upset about it and he doesn't and he has those big feelings and so he has a hard time managing that. And so his kindergarten teacher would always say, you either play with everybody or you can choose to play alone because she was trying to kind of foster this inclusivity. That's, I don't um, like that at all. I have to say, like, like I mean, what, can you, would you say that to an adult? Like, no, you can't go and have a coffee with your best friend. You either have to be by yourself or you have to invite all the other five people in your social circle. I think it was better for some kids than it was for my thing, maybe because there was maybe some picking on other people or some exclusion like oh no you can't play with us kind of stuff going on but so my kid ended up choosing playing alone because Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to play the same game that everybody else wants to play all the time but then he can kind of get jealous when that one friend that he does want to play with wants to play with other people so he has basically and he in his words he said i have no friends i like don't want to play with anybody else and as i'm an extrovert i really like being with other people and so it's really it's really important to me so it's very hard for me to, and i don't have adhd so it's very hard for me to understand a lot of what's going on is he is he unhappy mm-hmm. no he says he likes spending his recess alone do you think that's i mean I, i'm not saying i don't think it's true but it could be true or not true but do you think it's true like does he seem ha- like a, like happy 
And you said he does have neighbors that he that he plays with, right? Yeah, that's definitely his like best friend would be the neighbor kid who is also named Beckett, which is really fun. <laughs> so it's Big Beck and Little Beck. He, I think he's the type of person which is kind of similar to my husband too. So it's like helpful to know like what the adult version looks like. And like he would probably be fine with two friends for his whole life. Yeah. But that's so foreign to yes, how but I... See, you, you have this awareness. Like, I, 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 when you started talking, I was already going to go there that this is very different from what you would like because yeah. I could tell that that was what was happening. And I think you know that too. So you just have to lean in more to, like, reminding yourself, this is what... He's fine with this. I wouldn't be fine with this. And we're two different people. And so I, you have to keep reminding yourself about that, that, it, that it's working for him. And can I trust him at seven that he knows well enough that, like, it's okay that he doesn't have friends at school. Like, I mean, I think okay? if you think that if he if he seems like lonely and unhappy, and he says he's fine with it, I would not trust it. But if he seems like pretty cheerful and like not worried about it, I would trust it. I guess I'm not totally convinced that he's not unhappy or and alone. Is it true that he doesn't have friends at school? Like, have you asked his teacher? The teacher reports. I did ask, and on, like, the report cards, too. I, I haven't had a conference with her since the fall, but I go and volunteer at the school weekly. I actually go on, on Wednesdays to volunteer in the cafeteria because they they opened it back up for us, and, and I was like, maybe this would help if I kind of see a glimpse of his day. He really likes me being there, and it helped a lot to see that, like, oh, he does interact appropriately <laughs> yeah. with peers. There are people that he likes sitting by. There's one kid that desperately, desperately wants to be his friend. And Beckett is not interested. And so he's kind of firm about that boundary where he's like, don't sit next to me at lunch. And I'm like, it, he sounds fine. You can see that better. Th like, he is probably fine. Because but... when, it, when you say he he says he doesn't have any friends at school, it sounds like maybe he doesn't feel connected to anyone particularly at school and he doesn't have a best friend at school. But it sounds like he is social at school. And he's like, other people like him. He interacts with his peers. I, like it's that's totally different than I have no friends and I just walk around by myself staring at the ground and nobody talks to me and I don't talk to anybody. That's totally different. Yeah, it's not that. It's not that. People like if I pick him up, I'll hear people say bye, bye. like people like yeah say bye to him and he just doesn't answer. Well, it sounds like respond. he doesn't. He hasn't met anyone that you know tickles his fancy that he's like, oh, I want this person to be my best friend but he's social and he's open and i would i would not worry about that okay i guess i should stop projecting what i would want yes yes we should so, <laughs> it's so tricky to do though to, like you only it get is. these ones like have fun doing it it sounds like he is having fun I guess it's his own version of fun. It's not a it's not a bubbly uh, externalizing like visual kind of fun. Like, does he play with his brother a lot too? Yeah, well, at bedtime for sure. The most the most that they play together. But yes, yeah, they'll play together here. Yeah, um, so that's a social, I mean, even though it's his brother, that's filling a social need. Mm -hmm. And you know, introverts I'm an I'm an introvert also, and my oldest son is also an introvert. And he would come home from school and he'd just be like, "I'm, I don't want to play with anyone. Like I'm done. Like I've had enough social interaction for the day." Right. So I think it is hard for people who are extroverted to understand that you just reach your tolerance point and you just need to be alone or have quiet time or whatever. Yeah, he would say that after kindergarten a lot. That was a transition year for him for sure, where he would like he'd come home and just be like, "I don't want to talk to anybody." <laughs> So. so I think you just have to remind yourself that you're different and that his it is very difficult to see, to not look at things through our own lens of preference. It's very difficult. But remind yourself, he seems happy. He is social and liked at school. And he just hasn't met anyone that he's like, oh, yeah, I want. He, you know, I think introverts tend to have like, as you said, like you're with your husband, one or two like really close friends. And it can almost feel like a waste of time to an introvert to have like a whole bunch of friends because you want to have more of a deeper connection with just a few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's definitely what he has with the neighbor. Like that kid, they, you know, share a lot of interests and they, you know, spend a lot of time together outside of school. So he does have friends mm -hmm. or he does have a friend and he does have his brother. 
Well, yeah. the the reason why I sort of was segueing into school was, and wondering if he had his, if he understood about some of the challenges that he faces with how his brain works, is you can reinforce the sleep thing will make things easier at school. Mm-hmm. Like it's always mm-hmm. easier to, you know, keep yourself regulated and when you have more resources. Mm-hmm. So you could talk to him about that too, as part of that intrinsic motivation to stay in bed is, I know school's almost over for right now, but it it makes things easier during the day when you're rested to do the things mm-hmm. that you want to do. And I wouldn't say like, it'll make you pay attention better to the teacher, but it'll it'll make it easier for you to do the things that you want to do. He understands that because he'll use, and I don't know if he's heard us say it too much, but he'll use sleep as a, like an ex, and maybe it's truth, but he'll, he'll say like, that he didn't sleep well the night before or he'll say it in like an extreme way he'll be like i only slept for like two minutes last night and i'm so tired today Mm -hmm. and i know danny and i like my husband and i have both said that sometimes like oh man i slept really poorly last night and now today i'm struggling and and so he will say that like i know he understands the connection it feels extreme. And so I think sometimes I get distracted by the, I know you slept for longer than two minutes. Right. The hyperbole distracts <laughs> you from the real, the exactly. real feeling behind it. Exactly. So, but thinking about like, okay, I understand, but you recognize that you're tired. You need more sleep and it's making your day harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, school is also just such a tricky place, I think, for people with ADHD because, and his teacher didn't recognize it earlier in the year because he, is so uh, afraid of getting in trouble that like, and this is part of the social thing that I, I worry about is he says he doesn't want to talk to his friends in class because he doesn't want to get in trouble for talking. And then I'm like, I get it on both sides, right? I get that the teacher needs there to be a certain level of quiet for the instruction. And then I worry that he's like, preventing himself from talking and engaging with his peers because he doesn't want to get in trouble you know so it's just it's a tricky school is such a tricky environment for kids that i it feels like for all kids especially at this age you know seven but the environment is just such a place where they have to be controlled all day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i don't know how how best you know, going into a new school year next year, how best should I articulate this to the teacher? Well, if you yeah. have a if you have a diagnosis of ADHD, that's going to be helpful. And you said you're working on that. That's going to be helpful. And, you know, hopefully, I don't know how much you've read about, you know, ADHD and supporting kids with ADHD, but hopefully you can introduce some supports in the classroom for helping him with like, you know, they have different, you know, wiggle seats or this like a rubber band you can put around the legs of the chair to give your foot something to do like there I don't know what all of the supports are but I know there are a lot of supports that if someone is recognized with ADHD that the the teacher should be willing to to do that and then I think it's also just trying to balance like how much can you as you said they have to be so controlled in the classroom like what is he doing outside of the classroom where he can be more free and you know even back to the rough housing thing maybe it would help him to do rough housing like right when he gets home from school to sort of release some of that pent up energy and impulses from the day that could, you know, roughhousing right before bed did not work for him. But it sounds like he still could use some regulating, possibly like that physical nervous system regulating, maybe doing that earlier in the day. Or like yeah, when he comes home def- from school. Definitely not at bedtime. But yeah, he he asks for it. He'll ask for monster battles and he'll ask for it. Stuff. So we should probably build that in more regularly. And that might help with the the bedtime thing, too. If you're I doing thought, that earlier. We in the started day. karate, and he does karate twice a week. And I thought, okay, great, you'll be extra tired on those days. Like maybe it'll be easier to fall asleep. But karate yeah. also involves a lot of contr- self control. Like he's it still, does, it's true. still a. I'm not that it's bad, but it's it's not a free uh, rough housing environment. Oh, you're right. That's such a good point. I mean, yeah, physical activity. Yeah, but it is not a. It's still a lot of control, from what I understand about con- karate. He's way into it, though. I'm That's like, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. I've given you so a lot to it is. It's a, and I want you to take away from from the, this is sort of like a, a underlying thread through everything we've been talking about. I hear you sort of worried about the future based on what you're experiencing now, right? Like he I want him to eventually 
fall asleep in his own bed without support. He will, right? He will figure out the school thing too. Like you're, you know, it's, it is hard for especially younger kids with ADHD in school before they have the, the resources and impulse control to, to coach themselves about like, you know, paying attention or reasons why you want to do things other than just not getting in trouble. But he's still very early on in his brain development and maturity and experience. It's fun to think about it that way because he's been my kid for seven years and it feels like, you know, from baby to toddler to preschool to now, it's like he's so big now. And it does, it is that tricky thing. I think you guys said in one episode that five is a really tricky age because we look at them and we, and we recognize that they're so capable in so many ways, mm -hmm. but then they're still not capable in so oh, many ways. And in and so many good. ways, also, five is a much more appropriate way to think of him because of the yeah. ADHD, right? Yeah. Like the expectations that you have for him should be, should match that two to three years behind in some of areas of, of development. And just as you, I love how you brought up how different he is from newborn to seven. He will be equally different from seven to 14, right? Mm. Like those huge changes that happen from zero to seven, they're just as big from seven to 14. So really like what you're seeing now is a very early, an early model of Beckett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, my area of expertise is definitely like the little, like I'd say like, you know, two to four, like that age range is where I'm the most comfortable. So I feel like I'm getting out of my comfort zone, but I'm still not quite to, like you said, 14. Those, the consequences when people become teenagers just feel so much heavier and bigger and more real, like, you know, and so I'm, I'm fine with his con kind of controlled problems where it's, it's all safe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the, you know, the risks and consequences still feel a little bit mild, though they're much bigger than when he was two. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, thinking about, okay, in seven more years, he'll be a totally different version of himself still. Yeah, yeah. And when you think about, and you know, one of the biggest benefits of doing peaceful parenting all the way along is that, yes, the risks and consequences are much bigger when kids are 14 or 16 or whatever, but they've also learned through all of these years that you're on their side and they can come to you if they're having challenges, right? I think that's the, the, the thing that I've seen has the most, is like the, the best positive and the gravest negative is that when kids get to that age and they get into a sticky situation and they feel like they can't come to their parents that's when bad things happen so really like raising him with peaceful parenting and knowing like my parents always have my back I'm not going to get punished for making mistakes and they're always going to be curious and help me figure things out that is a very very big of course there's no guarantee but that's a very big insurance policy against those consequences uh, and risks of the teen years mm -hmm. I feel like my work in that right now is also not making him feel like I want him to be different. Mm -hmm. And by different, I mean more like me. Yes. So the less I can kind of put those expectations that he will, you know, experience the world like I experience the world. I think I can hear myself sometimes in conversations where I'm like, well, don't you want to have more friends at school? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I would want. It's right. And, and also, I think to remember that kids with ADHD often do have a bit of a harder time with, you know, some self-esteem issues because they get corrected so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that you're already thinking about how can I make him, you know, how can I help him accept himself for who he is and how can I accept him for who he is? He actually said that yesterday we were talking about it and he goes, why do you keep talking about friends at school? You're making, I think he said you're making me feel embarrassed. Like the more you bring it up. And I was like, okay, I just, I'm not trying to make you feel. Like he was getting a sense that you thought there might be something to be concerned about. And he was yeah, like, he can, yeah, yeah. He can sense it. He can yeah. sense that I am like pushing him in a direction that he's like, not a natural direction for me to go. Right, you know? right. Yeah. yeah. Like aren't I, like, it's almost like an underlying, aren't I good enough the, the way I am? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's like, oh, I don't want to project that onto him that like he needs to be a certain way. So, well, your yeah. awareness yeah. is fifty percent of it, so that's great. You know, the yeah. awareness that you have <laughs> the other fifty percent to go <laughs> is acting. Well, it's acting out of the awareness that you have that he's yeah. not you and that he's different. 
And is it okay to say those things out loud? Like whenever I recognize it, where I'm like, oh, I'm talking about friends because that's something that it was important to me. But you're a different kid. Is yeah, that- sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your and just say you're a different kid. Well, and just say like I I'm working hard on recognizing that you and I are different, and that mm-hmm. you that things that are important to me might not be important to you, and vice versa. I think you could say that, but mostly saying it yeah. to yourself is the most important thing. Right. <laughs> right. Recognizing it. You don't necessarily have to say it all out loud. Yeah. I yeah. also told him that the other day. Like, yeah. I thought you can keep it in your head. You don't have to say it. So, yeah, I think that working on that radical acceptance of the kid that you have is mm-hmm. is also one of the big, you know, one of our big jobs as parents. At radical acceptance and unconditional love for, for all of the ways that they might be different than what we expected or who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be a daily reminder for me. Good. Still point. I mean, I love him for who he is, and it's still working through my expectations. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to stop, and we will talk to you in a couple of weeks and see how things went. Sounds good. Hi, Shaylin. Welcome back to the podcast. Sarah, thanks. I think it was just almost exactly four weeks ago that we talked last time, and we had a very, I was just reviewing what we talked about. We had a wide ranging number of topics from radical self ex- radical acceptance of your child where i think we ended on to adhd to sleep to friends so give us a little update on on where you're at did you did you talk to your pediatrician did you get a, a di- an assessment we yeah so we did actually have that conversation with the pediatrician later that same day after we spoke and like it did get a formal diagnosis of adhd And I was expecting that, right? Like I had said, I suspected it all along. And I was really surprised and impressed with how the conversation with the pediatrician went, actually. she It was very different from the last time we had met. Because last time she was just kind of like, you know, like, maybe here's some things you can try in the meantime. Um, But this time she kind of went a lot more in depth about some things for us to look out for. So... When, uh, you know, a person has ADHD, they're more likely to also experience depression and anxiety. And so we talked about that a little bit. And I was like, oh, yeah, like those have already been on my radar for this kid. He's, you know, I think that's part of the sleep stuff and part of the school stuff, too, is a little bit of anxiety that he's experiencing. And she asked about sleep. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, that's a challenge. She actually suggested a couple of things too. One was magnesium that he might be, he might benefit from taking a little extra magnesium. So we've tried a little bit. We haven't been super consistent because with the transition from school to summer, things have been a little bit, a little bit all over the place. We've traveled a little bit. And so that's something that I want to try a little bit more consistently. Like we've okay. tried it a little bit, but it, I know it needs to kind of build up. Yeah. Um, but she also mentioned, especially for kids with and he's kind of that mixed type ADHD right yeah like, impulsive like, impulsive and inattentive yeah type exactly. three. yeah so the so the kind of like some of the extra energy as well as the kind of focus and attention that can you know shift with his his preference for an activity or his, his lack of preference for an activity and and so she was also suggesting physical sports to help him be a little bit more physically exhausted by the end of the day as well. Yeah, that's um, something you and I had talked about and you had realized while we were talking that karate was probably not something that was going to fit that bill. Yeah, because I said the same thing. I, you know, I was like, yeah, he is in karate and it's but it's something that takes a lot of mental focus as well, which is really tricky, but he loves it. So, you know, we'll stick with it. But I think I'm going to try swimming is something that he's really into and would be, I know it just, it, you know, after you go swimming, you feel really, t- I feel really tired. So I know that that one would be good. But he is, I mean, I know he's tired at the end of the day. And so some of the things around sleep that that you had suggested, we've tried. So he really consistently, after we read together, he goes to our room to listen to his audio book. And so it's actually helped his brother get more sleep as well. Good. You're not doing as much of that kind of bedtime. Winding each other up. Playing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Beckett still has a really hard time sleeping. It's just going to be a thing that we work with. But it was really helpful perspective to talking with you. And it's really changed my mindset and, and my husband. Like I, I, you know, debriefed with him 
So our mindset around bedtime, we're getting a lot less frustrated with good issues because it's like, okay, this is just what it is. He needs more support. We don't need to be locked into him falling asleep in his bed every night. Like it's okay that he's falling asleep in in our bed. He still has a hard time doing that. And so sitting with him is really helpful. So he wants me to sit with him. And oftentimes that's also a time of day that I have other, I have another agenda in my mm-hmm. head about things that I need to get done or stuff that I could clean up or, you know, whatever. And so it's really, I mean, everything with parenting comes down right to the the expectations of the the adult in the relationship. And so having my expectations just kind of reset. And I love, you know, and maybe you can explain it better, but your little reminder to drop your agenda and just be present with mm-hmm. your kid in that mm-hmm. moment. I have to remind myself of that. So if he's like, he's like, come sit with me. And I'm like, okay, he needs me right now. It won't yeah. be like this forever. Yes. The other stuff can wait. I love okay. that you're reminding yourself because I was just going to say, and remember, it's not going to be like this forever. So I yeah. love that you're already reminding yourself of that. Yeah. Yeah. So even last night, he was listening to an audiobook in our room, and I had actually taken my laptop into the guest room to do some work to catch up on thing last night. And then he came in to cuddle with me while I was doing work. And my husband, Danny, suggested, well, maybe he just, you know, maybe he can just fall asleep next to you on the guest bed while you're doing work. And I was like, brilliant. Yeah, of course. It's a great idea. And it, it worked right away. Like he Good. laid down and he basically was asleep within like three minutes it sounds like he just really needs more support around falling asleep and that you you were you were deeply resisting that because of our our like cookie cutter image of like you've you know the two kids get tucked in and get a kiss and then you don't hear from them the rest of the night it's some kids just aren't like that that ideal is so lovely isn't it lovely right like it would be perfect but that's just not it's just not our kid I mean, and not right now, you know, probably in a few years it will be like it does. It does. They do. Eventually, kids who need a lot of support falling asleep eventually don't need it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's fine. He's he's also getting up in the middle of the night and coming and joining me in bed as well. And so that has happened quite a bit more since the transition to summer. And I think And I read somewhere at one point, which was really helpful, that summer can be particularly challenging for kids with ADHD because of all of the change in routine and, you know, not knowing what to expect and kind of all of that stuff. And I said that out loud. And it was really helpful because Danny heard me, my husband heard me say that. And then I heard him talking to Beckett about that later that same day. He was like, hey, mom said something earlier today. That I remember being a kid and having a really Aww. hard time during summer too. And I was nice. That's so helpful. Thank that's you. That's awesome. Doing that. Yeah. So, so, you know, that's something that we're aware of. We're talking through. They have this week, they did start a camp. And I think that that's been helpful for them to mm-hmm. have activity that he's doing. It'll tire him out too. Been out of school for like two weeks already. And so he had like two weeks of kind of, you know, no structure of any kind and so and this is a camp that he went to last year and he really liked and so having some structure this week has been helpful he came home monday just grumpy as anything and and i was like i think he you know he used a lot of energy and he was with people again all day and like that that's tricky but yesterday was really good good so i think it's a little bit of a transition but that helped him to have something that he enjoys doing. Yeah. Well, and um, just back to the, the reframe, like a, a little bit more of a reframe is just when you were talking about how it's hard to be do, being that support person when you have other things that you want to be doing. I mean, I, I can't remember if I said this last time, but I never got so much reading done as I did when I, in those years when I would sit with the kids while they were falling asleep. And if you can even just think this is my time to listen to a podcast or read a book, mm-hmm. or I mean, as you said, even have your laptop and catch up on work, maybe just finding a way to make it nice for yourself that when you're sitting in there would be helpful. You know, I actually listened to your podcast one time when I was sitting in there with my other kiddo um, because he also wanted me one night and I was like, hey, I can be in here, but I can't talk to you because that's what he wants. He wants to just have conversations the whole time. And so I was like, I have my headphones in and I'm not listening 
to you, I'm listening to a podcast for me. And it was a podcast that it was one of your episodes, which was really helpful because it's like in the present, a reminder of like what you're trying to do. Yeah, you know. that's awesome. Well, and and I, that's what I used to say to my kids, too. I can stay as long as you're still and quiet because mm-hmm. they really wanted me to stay. And so if they started moving around too much, because I think sometimes they do that to keep themselves awake. You know, when you're driving and you get Definitely. really tired and you have to like you know, slap yourself on the face and move around to keep yourself awake. I honestly think kids will move around a lot to try not to fall asleep. So I would say, if you're still in quiet, I can stay. That's exactly what Beckett does all night. Like there's uh, karate moves that he's practicing in bed. He'll be like doing the roll. There's like a karate roll that he's really into. It's his favorite one. And he's like been practicing over and over it on the bed. And I'll come in there and I'll be like, buddy, you got to keep your body still. Yeah. But yeah, I think it, it's definitely what he's doing. He's like moving because he's tired and he's resisting going to sleep. There could be, now that I think about it and hear you say that out loud, there also could be like some regulation attempts happening too, like to get the last of the, you know, getting regulation through movement. So it could be, yes, I don't want to fall asleep. But, and also it could be like yeah, regulating attempts for the mm-hmm. nervous system. So how do you balance that then? Well, we talked last time about doing more activity earlier in the day, which could help, like just to get that more, you know, even doing, I know you said rough housing doesn't work, but I wonder if things like earlier in the day, it does. Yeah, earlier in the day, but even like right before bed, doing like the wheelbarrow up the stairs, or I don't mm-hmm. know if you have stairs, but, you know, something that's not rough housing, but that's physically, that gives some physical input or even maybe like a, like a compression massage or something like that. Like, I'm just trying to think of, I mean, I'm not an OT, but I'm trying to think of other ideas that I've heard. Like, if you can maybe get some physicality in that's not rough housing for just a few minutes. Yeah, it actually, he asked for it. Is it Wednesday? (laughs) So it was just last night. He, uh, after we read, it was my turn to read. And after we read, he like got in my lap and I'll play a game where I'm like, um, oh, I love you so much. I'll never let you go. And I do like skim tight and then I tickle a little bit. And he was like, He asked for it. He said, like, don't let me go. And I was like, okay. And so we did that for just a a couple of minutes. And then he went to the other room and I heard Danny was still kind of like playing a game with him, like kind of playing. And then I was with our other kiddo doing it a little bit too. And so I think that that helped. Like he is asking for it. He does need it. It just, it's our work to be more consistent with it, which Mm -hmm. is super tricky when our days don't look the same every day and it's like our heads, me and my husband's head are in so many places. Yeah. Busy life. Yeah. yeah. It, it just occurred to me, what about a uh, weighted blanket? He has one. Okay. Yeah, he has one. He hasn't used it in a while. It's kind of been pushed at the foot of his bed for a little while. So that might be, but maybe we're trying like bringing back out again. Mm-hmm. But he has liked it. And mm-hmm. mm-hmm. he was like, Four. I think we got it when you were four. Yeah. Well, and it could be, I know they recommend different weights for different sizes. So you might want to just review like if it's big enough, like if it's the right the right weight for him now that yeah, he's, he's seven. He is a lot bigger now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's worth looking into again. Yeah. All right. Well, what about, I'm just trying to think if there are any other thing. I think, you know, the other major thing that we talked about was you're feeling worried that he didn't have enough social interactions being the extrovert that you are and and we talked about that have you did you give any more further thought or or observation to that yeah i think our conversation was just super helpful to just acknowledge out loud that he's not the same as i am and and that it's okay that he can he can have his socialization in different ways I think particularly I was worried about it at school and with him being really worried, which I think is maybe some of the, you know, um, manifestation of some anxiety that he does experience around like getting in trouble or kind of getting called out. He he says he doesn't like when people look at him. Um, and so uh, after receiving, we had we had one week after receiving the the formal ADHD diagnosis before school was out. And I just, I'm so appreciative the school really like moved quickly because that was another thing the pediatrician said. She was like, yes, I do highly recommend that he gets some support in school and get it in place now before we get to those 
kind of higher grades when things start to get more complicated for him. And so the school really turned it around and we had such a good conversation with his teacher from this year so that next year can be start can can start on like a really strong foundation of understanding about him because he can I think he does tend to mask a lot at the beginning of the school year. And so it takes a while for the teacher to get to know him. So it's going to be really helpful. The plan that we put in place, I think, has some you know positive behavior reinforcement rather than any punishment or negative attention for things and some other, you know, like a wiggly chair for him to sit in and some specific academic supports as well so that he can remember the instructions for whatever the task might be with like visual reminders and that sort of thing. And so I feel a lot better with him going into the next school year, not having to worry as much about, quote, getting in trouble Great. for interacting with people because he will kind of make movements with his hands, the teacher was saying, which can be really distracting for his friends. So I feel a lot better about getting those supports. Like it's just a like a 504 plan for him for starting second grade. And then I have asked if he wants to have like play dates with any friends. And he's just okay taking a break from that. And for now, got his, you know, neighbor friend. Um, and he really looks forward to playing with him. And that his brother. And who well. They, they've got some stuff that they're working <laughs> through, those brothers. Uh, he definitely have, has issues. He, he's in a, in a rut right now of saying that he doesn't love his brother. He's like, mm. I don't love him. I never have. And, and it's kind of, yeah, sometimes I don't know exactly what to say in that. I'm like, mm. yeah, those are strong words, you know. Be really mindful of the words that you're saying. Each so, brother. So, so I would just empathize and I would say something like, you don't have to even address when he says, I don't, he's trying to express something to you. And it's probably yeah. like a sense of a bit of jealousy or sibling rivalry, or even, you know, if, if his brother doesn't experience the same. So sometimes you have one sibling who life feels a little bit harder just because they have ADHD mm -hmm. and their, their sibling doesn't, or they're more sensitive and their siblings more easygoing. And even if you're following all of the best practices for sibling rivalry, there can still be a sense of like, why is his life easier than mine? Mm -hmm. So it could be a little bit of that. It also could be just like, you know, he's the baby and, you know, Beckett's a little bit jealous of the, that he's maybe gets a little bit more babying or whatever. So, I mean, a side note on that, baby Beckett, like, you know, find times to pretend he's a baby or like really, you know, give him that nurturing. But what I was going to say was when he says, I don't love my brother, I never have, I would just say something like, oh, it must be really hard to be a big brother sometimes or say, it must be hard to have to share me and daddy with your brother. I totally get it. Because I think he's just looking for some acknowledgement that, that you know, there is some difficulty there for him. Yeah, I I have said that in the past, like, oh, man, it's, re it's got to be really hard to have a brother, huh? And he'll be like, yeah, I hate it. And I'm like, OK, that's fine. I also just like the word hate. I just he can be Beckett talks really confidently all the time. And and he's loud, very similar to his dad, which is, is just so funny. But they're just very loud and they speak very confidently. It's like he knows everything already. And so it's also just kind of I feel like there's a like a an overlap with using really strong language like hate my brother. I don't love him like those sorts of things. And and having him be kind of, well, just really stubborn and, and a little obstinate about him always being right about things. Like mm -hmm. he'll just state facts about animals or he'll say, say all these things. And sometimes I think he, you know, it's based on something that he learned somewhere along the line. And sometimes it's very clear that he's just making this up. And so, and I'm like, yeah, buddy. And so I try to ask and like, did you learn that somewhere or is this coming from your own brain and your own thought about what this might be like? And he's like, no, no, I know it's real. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like he's looking for competence, competence, a sense of competency, right? Of being good at something. And his little brother happens to be really competent at math. Mm. And he's my, like the five-year-old is much faster and much more interested in math and just likes to kind of talk about math problems out loud all the time. And, and it, it does. He's he's quicker on it than Beckett. Mm -hmm. 
And I and I can see that Beckett gets annoyed by that and gets bothered by it and it's like frustrating for him. There's definitely some rivalry stuff going on. So it's interesting that you say that he's looking for competence because he is so competent and so, you know, he's got a lot of ideas, especially when it comes to like science and animals in particular. Like those are some areas where he is incredibly strong and and competent already for a kid, you know? So it's like, Words don't seem to be enough for him to like mm-hmm. recognize that because we do say it all the time. Like even this morning, Danny was like, you know, a lot of kids ask for a pet or a puppy and they, you know, take care of it for a you know a couple of days and then they lose interest. But he does such a great job of helping to care for our chickens in our backyard, and he loves them. And he was even reminding me this morning, we've got a, a thick chicken who happens to be in the house right now, which is terrible. But it's too hot outside for her; she's sick and. And so he was like, mom, get her food and water. She needs it. I think she's hungry. And so yeah. Danny was recognizing in word that like, hey, you're a really good caretaker for animals. And you you know, are really responsible and you are in tune with what they need. And that's really awesome. And so like we say those words, but it doesn't seem to be quite enough for him. Mm-hmm. Or I don't know, maybe we need to say it more. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I mean, self-worth is not about what other people think of you, which is what the words are. It's how you think of yourself. So pointing out to him things like that he takes really great care of the chickens. I love that because that helps him feel like he he know he can see that. And it's like, you know, I've noticed that you take really good care of the chickens. And it's not the important part of that isn't that what you think, it's that you're drawing his attention to how he can feel about himself. So Mm -hmm. you know, continue on with that, but it's not really the words of praise. It's more the words of helping him notice things about himself that that are competent, that's going to be helpful. Do you see the distinction I'm making? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of like the growth mindset thing where it's not like you're so smart, but it's like you worked really hard at this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of similar to that. Is that yeah, what yeah. You're... It's not what you and Danny think of him. It's what, what he thinks of himself. And mm-hmm. if he, you know, looks at himself compared to his brother and finds himself lacking just because he's you know doesn't have a lot of perspective yet you can definitely help him see areas where he is competent and find more op- find opportunities for him too to be good at things so i think that would help but i wanted to say one thing about the oh the when you talked about hey and he says i hate my brother i love my mentor dr laura markham i love her position her how she talks about the word hate which is that Hate is not an emotion. It's a position that we take when we're afraid it's never going to work out with another mm-hmm. person. So hate isn't actually like a feeling. It's just, it's more of a fear, right? Mm-hmm. So I think if you can reframe that for yourself, you don't have to say anything different to him, but just really, you know, he does not hate his brother, mm-hmm. but he's he has some fears that, you know, it's, it's he's never going to have good feelings or they're not going to work it out. So I would just, just reframing mm-hmm. that for yourself. Yeah, thank you. I will remember that mm-hmm. and I will try. It's just it's, it's such a strong word. So it's it's kind of provoking, you know, and, it, and I think that's a little bit of what he's looking for to you. Right. Well, it's, he's trying to get you to understand how he feels. Yeah. But it's important, right, not to respond to the words he using, but yes, to the feeling you're dealing. dealing. Yeah. And, and I think you could also say to him gently if he says things about his brother, you know, you could say there's nothing about what. Theo does that takes away from you. Mm. Just kind of plant that seed. He's the kind of kid that gets really irritated if you talk directly about a thing. So he he brushes a lot of that off. Mm-hmm. And so I, he like in particular, I think I've heard a lot that like boys in particular, and especially kids with ADHD, if you talk talk at them too much it doesn't it's not retained that it's more irritable so i i've tried i and but my husband and i are both very verbal like we're very communicative we we tend to over talk at them i know and so it's a it's a tricky balance of saying enough to him about these things and not doing it so directly that he'll bristle at it and push me away and you know, well, I love the strategy of letting him overhear you talking to your partner about something. Yeah. And so that, maybe yeah. you can think of something analogous and let him overhear you talking to Danny about it. Oh, that that's really good. We mm-hmm. can do it. 
Mm-hmm. We, I think we'd try a little bit. I, I try a little bit, but I'll be more confident. About it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe like at work, there's somebody who got something great and you can sit, talk about how at first it made you feel a little bit jealous. And then you realize that just because this person got recognized, it doesn't take anything away from you or or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, great catch up. I'm glad that the reframe was helpful for you because, you know, sleep is something that we cannot make anyone do. <laughs> would that Would that we could. I know. It's that everybody's been looking for like the magic, like magic secret sauce for getting kids to sleep. Just it's not real. It doesn't exist. <laughs> I heard this funny thing years ago that you spend the first 10 years of your life trying to get your child to sleep. You spend the next 10 years of their life trying to get them to wake up. And then the next 10 years of their life wondering who they're sleeping with. <laughs> so always sleep the questions. It's lighting up for us. We'll see you <laughs> part. Sorry, Bert. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, my daughter tucks me in most nights now, so it does it does change. That's really sweet. That yeah, yeah. All right. Well, it was really good to catch up and keep me posted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.